Good evening, and welcome to the Case School of Engineering's online information session. Tonight, we will be discussing biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, macromolecular science and engineering, and material science engineering. Your hosts will be uh, Professor Dustin Tyler from Biomedical Engineering, Professor Heidi Martin from Chemical Engineering, and Professor David Chiraldi from Macromolecular Science and Engineering. My name is Lynn Marie Hamill from the Office of Undergraduate Studies, and I will be taking your questions via email to be answered live on air. If you have a question, please send it to summerregehelp at case.edu with the subject line Info Session. If we don't answer your question live, we will follow up with you via email shortly. Now to your host, Professors Tyler, Martin, and Chiraldi. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, said, I'm Dustin Tyler from Biomedical Engineering. And I'm Heidi Martin from Chemical Engineering. I'm Dave Chiraldi from Macromolecular Science and Engineering. Okay. I guess this, this evening we're going to provide a, a brief overview of the core curriculum for engineering in general and our three majors specifically. And we're also going to speak about uh, one of our sister departments, uh, Material Science and Engineering. Um, so this is going to be a, a, a basic overview, and then we're going to leave a lot of time for questions. So I guess maybe we'll just jump right in. Um, one of the, one of the keys to the engineering curriculum is what's called the, the, core, the core engineering courses. The, these six courses are common for all the majors. So whether you're a, a chemical engineer, a biomedical engineer, a polymer science and engineering major, or any of the others, you're going to take these same courses. And you know, as you'll see on the, uh, the PowerPoint slide on the screen, uh, the, what these six courses are. Um, the, we'll talk a little bit later about the order which you'll take some of these based on our majors. But I guess one of the things we want to impress upon you throughout is uh, each of the departments has a website. And that website has this information there. If you think you know you're going to be, say, a mechanical engineer, uh, you go to the mechanical engineering uh, website, and you will be able to see which which order these should probably be taken in. Should we go to the next mm -hmm. slide? Um, I mean, I'll continue. So uh, the K School of Engineering is, is comprised of seven different departments. And you can see in this slide, the departments have one or more majors within them. And so you can get, get an idea of the, the breadth of the majors and, uh, that are available to you. Um, I think that um, the one thing we'd like to point out now is I think you're probably aware that at case your first year, you don't have to declare the major. So when you come in, I think one of the key things you want to keep in mind is, is um, these are all available to you. But you should get out and, and explore each of them. If you don't know for sure what you want to be at, go talk to somebody and go talk to the faculty in that department. Explore them because you have basically the first year. And as you'll see, as we get in here, the curriculum for these are all quite similar. So your first semester, there isn't the pressure of picking one and getting into it. You'll have the opportunity to explore them. And you'll see very, uh, as we talk through this, a lot of similarities in the curriculum. So I think the, the key point here is to make sure that even though you may know you're in engineering, and think you know where you want to go, you have time to explore and check those out to see which way uh, you maybe really want to go once you get here and get some experience with them. And, and one more thing about that is that it's okay to have an interest in multiple departments mm -hmm. because uh, some students do get a minor in one engineering department and a major in another or even a double major. So having interest in both, uh, you know, multiple areas is just great. So yeah, just stay open. So a key, okay. part of, uh, a key part of the curriculum, I think, too, that I want to emphasize is that um, it's not just about classes. Uh, I think uh, I see in my experience a lot of people come in and the students, or a lot of students come and they get very focused on getting grades in their classes. Uh, but you have to remember that, that your education is a lot more than just getting grades out of a book. Uh, those, are, those will get you to a point, but what's more important is the experiences that you have going through. So the next couple slides we're going to talk about uh, different opportunities that are, that are available to you that uh, get get you outside of the classroom and basically apply those skills that you're learning in a book. The book doesn't do much for you, applying those skills do. So keep in mind that it's not just your classes, get out and explore the opportunities that we're going to talk about here. And it's the beauty of, re of engineering at Case is you have opportunities from research, which you have up on the screen here now, you should be able to see. 
Um, the, the faculty at Case and the engineering school are well funded. There's over uh, $30 million of uh, annual expenditures and that may not mean a whole lot, but I can tell you what it basically means is there's toys to play with. <laughs> and good toys. Good toys, big toys sometimes. We have the students play with them sometimes too. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the opportunity is to um, to get out there and, and work with the research and I know one of the differences or one of the things that I think is very good about CASE is it's not something you have to wait till your junior senior year. Um, I have freshmen that work in my lab for example um, that start as a freshman in the lab and then by their senior year so I'm in biomedical engineering they're doing clinical trials uh, with devices and people and those type of things so it's not something that we're just saying now for you to think about in three years but take a serious look at these because these are opportunities that you can start exploring when you show up in the fall. And so a few of them that uh, are worth mentioning and places to start looking are the source program, which is, you can read the titles, I don't need to read that for you, but essentially it's an organized group that looks at the funding and different uh, research opportunities. Summer research uh, opportunities, uh, REU program, which is a research experience for undergraduates. And then each of the various centers and departments have things such as CLIPS, uh, which you can talk more about. Sure. In fact, CLIPS is, is unique in that it's the only materials-oriented National Science Foundation Science and Technology Center in the U.S. So basically, the, it's a $40 million investment in the federal government in doing advanced materials research at the Case campus. And we have high, high school students, undergraduates, graduate students, all working together as teams. And so this is one of many such places where you can jump right in. You know, there's many times we hear from students, well, I'm just a freshman, I've only been here a day, a week, a month, whatever. The answer is good, get in. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one, can I add one more thing about uh, the Thank research? You. Yeah, actually, I went to Case uh, myself for both undergraduate and my graduate degrees, and I started to do research as a freshman. Uh, in, uh, in chemical engineering. So it is a great, you know, uh, Dave mentioned about working in teams and that's one of the great advantages even as a first year student of getting involved because you get exposed to this large group of, of a diverse set of people of, at different st stages in their education. So you get uh, really involved with that. And if you do decide to go into research, there's multiple ways to actually do research. You can take research for credit uh, as part of your curriculum. You can get paid to do research uh, if funding is available or you can volunteer. Sometimes faculty will have you volunteer first to get your feet wet and let you see how you like research and how you, know, how you feel about the time commitment that goes into it. And I think the other thing from the faculty side is that's how you know, a lot of students want to do research. They show up for a day or two and then they don't want to do research. So the volunteer is a good way to sort of show that you're uh, engaged. The other thing I'll mention, you know, Heidi mentioned you're working with students at various different levels. That can be disconcerting sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I'll emphasize that uh, my experience is the case students like to help the case students. So while the first day in the lab might be disconcerting when you were working with a fourth year uh, undergraduate or even a fifth year grad student, it's, it's kind of scary looking what they know when they're kind of walking circles around. But ask the questions and don't let that in intimidate you. Um, they're there to help and they'll, they'll explain what they're doing. They love to talk about what they're doing most of the time and get you going. So it's certainly something you should be getting involved with and not feel um, scared to do. So the, the, the next uh, um, hands-on sort of education we'd like to highlight briefly is co-op, cooperative education. In this case, you have the opportunity to go off campus, typically work f for a company uh, for one or two semesters in a row. Um, you can be there for half a year. Some, there have been some students who have actually gone on co-op for an entire year working for either anywhere from a startup company to a major corporation, you get paid. In fact, you get paid well. You get, this is the first inkling that you are starting to become an engineer because you're starting to get paid like an engineer. And th this is a growth opportunity. When the students come back from co-op, they are different people. They really, suddenly they are practicing engineers. They stand head and shoulders above the crowd. If you're planning on going to college for four years and going out and working in the, in the field as a bachelor's degree engineer, this is your calling card. In fact, if you do a good job, the company you co-op for will probably try to hire you, but everyone else will too. Mm -hmm. uh, so you are an inc incredibly valuable person. If you decide to go on to graduate school or professional school, you just have that much more going for you. So it's a really great opportunity.
I mean, I'll even add to that and say that in, in, now, in today's environment, it's almost getting to the point where you have to co-op almost. I mean, a lot of, a lot of places, especially the bigger or companies, yeah. either hire from their co-op pool or the intern, which the difference is sort of the intern is a summer program, co-op includes a semester off of the educational side. So semantics more or less, mm -hmm. but getting involved. And the other thing I hear students say sometimes is I don't want to take an extra year for my education. And that's pretty short-sighted, honestly. I mean, that extra year, as uh, Dave said, you're paid, which isn't all that bad. And, and I will echo the sentiment, the student, you as a student come back completely different, completely different, much more engaged in the education. So it's, it's very good from that perspective. And the last thing I'll add to it um, is from my perspective, since in the biomedical engineering department, our students go equally, equal parts, about 30% of the students end in med school, 30% end in uh, grad school, and 30% end in the industry. And there's a lot of students that are uncertain which one of those three tracks they want to go. Co-op is a great way to figure that out. So if you think you might be interested in industry, but you're not sure if you want to go to grad school or to med school, I highly recommend you doing this. I've had uh, plenty of students that have gone to co-op and come back and said, whoo-hoo, not, not working in that world, mm -hmm. and go off into med school. And conversely, students that thought they were going to be in med school end up going off into industry after their co-op experience. So it really helps you solidify where you're going to want to be. And that extra semester to figure out what you want to do with your life is worth every minute of it. So. And in terms of getting involved in co-op, typically students uh, go for co-op after their second year. Uh, but you might, uh, depending on which department you go into, you might have that discussion with your advisor once you declare your major because different departments may prefer you to take their co-op at different times. So, but usually it's after your sophomore year. Oh, go ahead. Just, I'll just introduce you on this. Um, there are a number of incredibly cool things that faculty members have come up with to broaden the way we teach. And one of the, one of the most interesting and fun ones that I've ever heard of is a program that came out of our chemical engineering department that allows you to go over to Africa and take one of the core courses. And I'll let, since Heidi is from chemical engineering, I'll let her talk about what she and her colleagues do there. All right, thanks, Dave. Yeah, the, um, the two of our faculty, Dan Lax and uh, Mohan Sankaran, are currently offering one of the engineering core classes that we mentioned to you before uh, as a four week, or actually it's three weeks plus a week of uh, uh, fun time, <laughs> uh, three, a four-week course in May as an intensive course. You get to go over to Botswana uh, in Africa for this course. Uh, so it's a fantastic opportunity for students to go and apply engineering, uh, not just to the real world, but to you know a, a developing country. So you get to see real-world issues uh, and apply that to your your core class. Uh, and, and this actually came out of uh, a research uh, project that uh, Professor Lax and Sankaran were involved with in Africa, and they started offering these educational opportunities. They also offer a research experience, an REU program in Botswana, and actually in chemical engineering, some of our seniors are doing a design project, and they go over to Botswana or Senegal uh, to observe what's going on in a village, and then they come back and they design something that would be applicable for the village. Actually, the picture that's on your slide right now is uh, a set of chemical engineering seniors plus Professor Lax and Professor Sankaran and the local leaders there in, uh, I believe this one is in Botswana. Uh, and these students came back uh, and were involved with a, um, a water purification project uh, when they came back from Botswana. This was last year. This year's group actually were, went to Senegal and their project ended up involving um, trying to come up with low power uh, ways to charge cell phones since this particular village did not have electricity. So this is, I guess, one example of an exciting opportunity that students can get abroad. Uh, there's a student group, Engineers Without Borders, uh, that are involved with projects around the world. This is, of course, part of a, a, a not just a case, but a larger uh, organization. Uh, and students also have the opportunity to even go abroad for, say, their junior year and take courses at other universities. So all these are uh, great things to look at, if, especially if you're interested in in going overseas. Anything? Okay. What's next? Okay. <laughs> student organizations. Um, there are more student organizations than you could possibly join, <laughs> or you don't have enough time to join them all. So you do need to practice a little bit of uh, critical planning here. But we each of the each of the engineering disciplines has 
an associated professional organization uh, that you can become a member of, a student member of. And this gives you an opportunity to not only meet the older students in, the, in your department, and, but also industry professionals will come in and speak to you. In fact, when I used to be in industry, I used to go to universities and speak to the, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers uh, session, sessions they would have and tell them about what we are doing in our plants. And so you, you can do this with other industry professionals. We have other organizations that are based around uh, who you are and key, uh, key things you might be interested in. For example, Society of Women Engineers. Uh, a great organization, and we have a very active chapter here. They work on developing their own pro professional uh, programs. They work on in interview skills. They bring in spe motivated speakers, and there's a, there's just also a lot of um, a lot of mixing and getting to know people. You know, it's very important to get to know people in your field. So these are wonderful organizations, and I think we'd all encourage you to in the fir first few weeks or a couple of months you're on campus to go out and explore, test these. You can drop in and visit. They want to, These groups would love for you to come by, visit them, have some pizza, and uh, get to know them. And then as you better understand kind of where you're going to sit on campus, then pick the organizations that you'd like to be part of. It's, very, it's, it's important. Yeah, I think this is sort of, this is following along on the theme that, uh, you know, Heidi was talking about going overseas, but this is the local opportunities to do the same thing, to get involved. Uh, for example, you see in the middle there, Create. This is a local, it's a design group. We have a summer program. We have students design over the summer. They, they find local problems. They talk uh, medical community in different places. Uh, next summer, we're going to have a uh, um, clinical intensive program in the BME area that we'll be doing. So there's a lot of opportunities here and abroad. But I think you'll see a theme that all of us are going to revamp on is get involved. The books are really important to give you an access into doing. Doing is critical, so to look for these things. But maintain a balance, too. Yeah, that's a good know, point. Because there's just so many things, and you're going to be excited about so many opportunities. So, okay, that's a good point. Leave a little time to go to yeah. class and yeah, do your a homework. Bit of time. Still, still want to see you in the classroom. Yeah. 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 We do want that good grade point average, folks, too. <laughs> you, you need that. But. All right. Exactly. All right. All right. So this is this is mine. So uh, we've talked about the the broad side, obviously, of of the ed education things to keep in mind, um, and. You'll see in a couple minutes when we talk about template schedules, I think many of you are actually signed on or here to, to figure out what you take in the fall. And we've given you a much broader picture. Uh, we'll get to that in just a minute of specific courses. And you'll actually see between the three of us, the first semester is really similar. What you really need to do is get in and talk to, talk to people in the department you're interested in when you get here to get the details. But let me give you an overview of the biomedical engineering program for those of you that might be interested. <clears throat> so I'll just give you the idea of how we're set up. And so if you're looking at the four-year program, what that's going to look like in general. And so um, a couple of the facts of the department, of course, down the left side of the screen there. We've been a top 15 program since we uh, started in the mid-60s. We're one of the first four programs in the country. Uh, we have about 500K on average per faculty and research money of, of what was talked about earlier. So a lot of opportunities for being involved, 23 faculty. Uh, one thing I like to point out is uh, we're really blessed, actually, from the biomedical engineering perspective to be in Cleveland. And I always look at Cleveland as our lab. Ultimately, we have, um, within 10 minutes, uh, actually within five minutes of walking, our three world-class hospital institutions for teaching. Um, and that carries a lot with it. The people there like to work with students and be engaged with student projects. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities in the medical field. Uh, let me give you the overview on the right side of the slide there, if you're looking at it, of what the curriculum, the way it's organized. And you'll see this, this sort of builds on the theme from earlier. If you look at the base of our curriculum, it's the engineering or the university core, the SAGES that you'll want to take. And we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, this year, I'm pretty excited. Uh, we're working towards offering a lot of SAGES courses that are engineering focused. Um, you may not have, all, they're not all necessarily on the register site yet, but do look for those that will come out as more of an engineering focused SAGES. Um, I don't know if there'll be enough slots right now for everybody to get one, but, um, but there'll be several of them. We're trying to get many of those out there. So if you're interested in a hands-on type of experience in the general education, you should be looking for those when they come out. And there's a few other courses that fit in the SAGES core. We build on top of that this engineering core, which is what we talked about earlier. Those are the key six classes that every discipline needs to take. And then on top of that, uh, we have a BME core set of courses, uh, and I'm not going to list the numbers for you. I'll talk a little bit about those um, 
uh, if come see me, basically. I mean, there's a BME core that we think that every student that goes into biomedical engineering needs to know. They relate to materials, they relate to physiology, instrumentation, those type of things. So that bottom three layers, everybody will take. <clears throat> and then biomedical engineering is a pretty broad area in the sense that um, if you look at the body, it can be a chemistry problem, it can be an electrical engineering problem, it can be a mechanical problem, depending how you want to go about things. And so the way I look at biomedical engineering or encourage you to think about it at CASE is you are an engineer first. We train engineers at the core. And so the first thing you want to decide is what kind of engineer would you want to be if you weren't going to be biomedical, which way would you want to do this? And so we're divided then into four tracks that correspond with sort of the core discipline areas. So if you're a biomaterials and interested in, the, in polymer chemistry or in chemistry and apply that to medical problems, that's the biomaterials track that would be of interest to you. If you like electrical engineering, the nervous system, neurology, neuroscience, uh, these are the bio, uh, devices and instrumentation. It's more of an electrical engineer type of focus. Biomechanics, I know that's a tough one, I know, but that's where if you're interested in mechanical engineering, orthopedics, uh, spinal implants, um, prosthetic limbs from the mechanical perspective, those type of things, that's the biomechanics track. And then the last one is the bio, uh, biological computing and analysis. So if you're into computer programming, embedded systems, um, image analysis, uh, um, information systems, those type of things, more of a computer science focus, you would want to get interested in that track. And the thing that distinguishes these four different tracks are you have a core set of, of courses that define the engineering piece. So for example, in the devices and instrumentation, there's a core set of courses that are electrically engineering based. And then on top of that, you can take electives, so you can get your interest in electrical engineering, and then we have a, a, a final course that ties them all together. So this is the, the theme and the, the structure of the curriculum. Uh, again may be confusing and there's a lot of details. You can certainly go to our website. All these are listed out to you in more detail and that's on the bottom here. You see it written out while you're looking at it. Um, and I think that's all I'll say about the curriculum. We'll give you a first semester here for each of us in just a minute. But in general, I think the thing to take home is that there's a core set in BME and then within that, the only real decision you'll have to make is which one of the four areas you're most interested in. Okay. All right. Um, Chemical engineering uh, is uh, actually probably one of the oldest, uh, one of the oldest engineering programs at Case. Uh, probably there was, I think the original name was industrial chemistry back in the 1800s, but we actually um, formed a chemical engineering degree in 100 years ago next year. We're celebrating our, mm -hmm. our centennial. Uh, so we, and we actually are one of the oldest chemical engineering programs in the country, and one of our most famous alums is Herbert Dow, who you may have heard of as the founder of Dow Chemical. Uh, so we go, we go way back. <laughs> um, and in terms of chemical engineering, uh, we are a very broad, uh, versatile degree in terms of the, the type of things that we do with the focus though being on engineering as applied to uh, chemical reactions, chemical transformations into making various products or actually uh, converting one form to another for energy. You'll see a lot of chemical engineers doing that. And the face of chemical engineering has changed over the years. You think of uh, chemical engineers a lot like these students you see on the right hand side. These are actually some of our seniors uh, in a plant with hard hats. Um, and that would, that's actually at Marathon Oil uh, locally here that picture was taken. Uh, so you think of chemical engineers as being in the ch traditional chemical industry. But we also do a lot of other things, uh, electronics, pharmaceuticals, food and other consumer products. Uh, you see a picture of Pringles. Procter & Gamble is a huge uh, employer of chemical engineers making all kinds of everything from cosmetics and um, you know, food products. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do as a chemical engineer. Um, and that's reflected in one of the things we have in our program, which is a breath sequence. So similar to biomedical engineering having specific tracks, chemical engineering has a breath sequence. Although it is a, a smaller set of courses, we have a, a larger set that are the same, and then you have three classes that you can specialize in, whether it be in the area of biochemical engineering, whether it be in electrochemical engineering, say if you want to go into um, energy in terms of batteries or fuel cells or solar, things like that. Uh, you can go into management. Uh, there's just lots of variety there and, and those are listed. Uh, the full list is on our website or you can even create your own sequence if you don't like what we have. 
Um, we're a smaller department uh, than biomed. We have 11 faculty, uh, but we're known for being a very collegial department, and they believe that carries over to our, not that biomed is not collegial, I should say, <laughs> but it's something we know about ourselves. And, and I know, as a, having been a student, that's the reason I came back to join the faculty is, is the way that the, the department culture is, and it carries over to our students. Um, one of the unique things we have uh, in our program is our senior design projects that are affiliated with companies. Uh, so our students work in groups and they actually get a real world problem and uh, do work for the company. And sometimes, I know uh, just last week we were hearing about one of these companies that's uh, going to implement uh, one of the projects that the students had done. And so that's an incredible thing to happen and a great experience for the students as well. And some of them get hired by these companies. So it's yet another way to get uh, interaction. So that's just a little snapshot of chemical engineering. And like Dustin said, we'll, we'll show you something about the curriculum in just a, a couple minutes. Right. Dave? Thank you. <clears throat> and so following suit, macromolecular science and engineering is yet another one of the engineering departments. Um, a little bit different, you know, whereas uh, chemical engineering is coming up on its 100th birthday and is you know, one of the foundational engineering. Um, we're coming up on our 50th birthday this year but we were the first. Uh, we, we have the pleasure of having literally created the degree. So when we talk about the degree requirements, uh, we, we thought them up. And so if you like them, it's our, we'll take credit for it. If you don't like them, I guess it was our fault. Um, <laughs> and, and at Case is a unique place, and there are only two schools in the United States where you can get an accredited engineering degree in polymer science and engineering, ourselves in southern Mississippi. Uh, so it's, you know, it is very unique. It is related to our sister department, material science, which, which worries about hard matter, we worry about organic matter. And organic matter is everything from 85% of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner to a lot of the biomaterials that, uh, that Dustin was talking about to um, a, a lot, uh, working in unison with the chemical engineers, a lot of the things that Heidi was talking about. I mean, you know, that, that detergent that Procter & Gamble uh, sells is, is a polymer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not, it's not just plastic soda bottles and plastic uh, pipes and things like that, but it's those two. Um, currently, 14 faculty members. We're, we are definitely a research-oriented department. So you can see, you know, we're, we actually have more PhD students than undergraduates, currently about 75 to 35. Uh, for you as a freshman, what that potentially means is a two and a half to one student to teacher ratio, which means you can get access to people. There, there's access across the whole campus. I don't want to say we're not the only people, but it's, it's relatively easy when there are a lot of graduate students to mentor you in the laboratory and a, rel a relatively large amount of faculty per student to work with. And in doing that, therefore, Students who come to us tend to be very research oriented. So we say here, research, research, and more research. Mm -hmm. That's typically, the average student who graduates out of the department does three years of research, many of them do four. So the second day that your college student, you could step in, we, when we talk about curriculum, we have a freshman research course that you can take and get in there and start doing research. Uh, and we push that, and we push that in the summers and everywhere else. And we think it's very important to be part of that meaningful work, work and educational experience you get here. Um, as far as the degree itself, very similar to the other two degrees that we're spoken about, there is a university core at the Sages that we'll take, you'll take regardless of what kind of student you are, what kind of engineer or even a non-engineer. Um, we then have the, the same engineering core of six courses that all engineering students take. And then we have our, our intro and advanced course as well. So our students take polymer chemistry, polymer physics, polymer engineering, and surround the subject so that you can, you can make that molecule, you can design it, you can process it, you can turn it into a device and do sort of the whole soup to nuts on it. Um, we have a very high rate of students going on to graduate school. About 75% of the students in the last decade have gone on to PhD programs. You don't have to. The other 25% typically go out and co-op and go work in, in the field in, in, or in plants. Uh, but certainly is, is, there's a real push and uh, our students are highly sought after there. Uh, we like to brag 100% employment for mom and dad who's thinking about uh, that down the road in four years. Um, and the other thing I just point out is because we created our own degree, we have the freedom to build in electives. And we thought because we're very interdisciplinary, some of our students really want to be almost a chemical engineer. And so we have a lot of electives, and if they want, they can go over and take five or six extra chemistry courses 
Uh, they can also turn that into a minor if they wish. So a lot of them really want to be almost a biomed. And so they can go over and they can take those. In fact, we have a second sequence now that is a biopolymers course that where you spend all of your electives over in biomed. Others want to be more mechanical or electrical. You know, and some just want to do a little bit of everything. Want to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and be more broad. And so um, it's available. And what you would do is you'll meet with your your academic advisor once a semester at least, and you'll talk about it and you'll plot out your course. So. And actually, regardless, just what you just brought about taking classes in other departments is that I think all of our curriculum are set up so that you will have the opportunity to take classes in the other departments so you'll get to sample, you know, some or more. In fact, so, you should. Yeah, that's right, you should. Okay. All right. So, why you're here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do in the fall? Um, and I think that um, we, as you might be able to guess, we could probably all talk about what we do for an hour and a half alone um, because we love what we do. <laughs> the thing I want to take, leave with you is today in the hour we're going to have with you or a time we'll have with you, hour and a half, whatever it is, I think an hour, oh. um, we can't tell you everything there is to say. So we're giving you examples We'll hopefully get you on this online registration to get you set up. But come talk to us when you get in because there's a million other things that you probably have questions about biomedical uh, and these other disciplines down the road. And I just can't exp answer them all here. We'll try and get some of your questions and stuff. But come see us. There's a lot of different things. And the other thing I want to emphasize about the curriculum is that, at least in biomedical engineering, we highly encourage not only taking courses in other areas, but getting that minor that is associated with it. So in BME, it says engineering core, you're an engineer applied in the health sciences, it helps to get that engineering minor as well as what you're doing. And so most of our tracks line up that if you take the right electives, a minor comes along with it, which works out really well. All right, so I'm not going to read this line by line because you can see it here. You'll see it in the um, archived piece and as well as if you go to the biomedical engineering website, which was listed earlier, or bme.case.edu, you can pull this out and review it later. And I think it's also probably in the FYI guide that you have. But the key thing I want to point out, there are two things that often end up in question is okay. the first one. Well, I guess I'm done. No, there we go. <laughs> that was fast. Heidi's in charge of things here. <laughs> she wants to get on quick. Um, the first one is in uh, line five there. It's, the, it's listed as EBME 105. This isn't a required course, but we found it to be very popular amongst the students uh, that come in. And what it is is an introduction to biomedical engineering. And so we've talked about the tracks. This course is where we introduce you to kind of on the day-to-day -day basis, what is it these do? What kind of careers can you expect? What kind of work happens in each one of the different tracks uh, that you would take? The other thing we're introducing, I mentioned earlier, and so we started this last year, it was very really successful, and we're going to continue this. I mentioned that one of the SAGES courses, or the set of SAGES courses, are going to be hands-on. In 105, what we do is we actually pair you up with, or a number of students will pair you up with senior design. So as Heidi mentioned, there's a senior design project. We have the same thing. Every one of the departments actually has senior design. But in 105, we also get students working with senior design class to get engaged in projects and actually be doing senior design with seniors to help them out and can talk through them. And we find that it serves two purposes. One is that you can talk with upperclassmen, learn what the real deal is, not what I'm telling you, and also kind of get some hands-on experience to, to motivate the rest of the course. And so we started that last fall, it was very successful, we're gonna continue that. So it's an option for you to get another hands-on experience. Say, for example, you don't get the SAGES course you want with the hands-on part, um, you can take the 105 and get it hands-on in BME design. Um, but it's not a required course, so you don't need to take that. That brings you up to 18, 19 credits. If you really don't wanna do that your first semester, um, 105 is optional, it's not required at all for the major. The other thing I'm going to point out is that uh, ENGR 131, you'll see listed here on line three, uh, that's the core computer programming uh, course. The only thing you need to consider when you do the registering is if you're interested in a track that's much more computer oriented, you're going to be taking EECS courses or electrical engineering courses, computer science courses that require that you take the EECS 132 version of that. So this isn't listed on the slide that's on here. Oh, it's down on the bottom. You'll see it in the footnotes. So the only real decision that you, you're, you're going to need to make in terms of this is if you're interested in a uh, the computing and analysis um, track, then you're going to want to take the EECS. And that's, that's probably the biggest confusion coming into our curriculum where you could get tripped up a little bit. So if you're not sure, uh, sign up for 131. You'll have two weeks to, to, to come talk to us, and, and you can certainly get that straightened out. But uh, if you know you're going to do a computing and analysis track, if you're interested in computer science side of things, I'd recommend you take the EECS 132 version. Other than that, it's a pretty common curriculum. Um, I think 
Uh, I know AP has come up as a question. I'd be happy to answer my thoughts on that later. And I think from the perspective of time, I'm not going to read through the rest of these courses. Those are the critical things for you in the fall on the BME side. And there's an example of year two of the type of things that are in there. But again, the first BME courses really happened with the BME 201 in the second year uh, and 202 in the second year as well. So beyond that, um, I'll answer questions if you have more detailed information, but I think uh, it's probably not worth the time right here for that. Okay. So as Dustin just said, the, the, the uh, curriculum is a common curriculum, which is on purpose, so that you get a common freshman year, and that way you still can make mm -hmm. decisions about what type of engineer you want to be. Uh, so this is the chemical engineering one, and one thing I'll point out uh, that we have different is a, it's actually a course similar to what Dustin talked about in BME. Uh, it's called ECHE 151, uh, which is listed also as number five on the, in the fall year. Ours is uh, zero credits, though, so it's not actually a course that has any homework or anything. It's primarily a seminar course, which you come once a week and you learn about the department and careers in chemical engineering. And it is required if you become a chemical engineering major, so it's better to take it now. And you obviously can get exposure to other students in your class and you meet the faculty early on. So I highly recommend that you sign up for that. And obviously, uh, it's not going to be a lot of work. You just uh, make sure that you stay awake. That's the only requirement. <laughs> uh, that's a requirement for any class, but <laughs> that'd be about the only one in this one. So um, hopefully you'll consider that. Um, something that I put on here, which applies to all of us, is uh, you know, people ask about AP credit. Uh, let me see how I get this. So um, just a couple, and we'll answer more questions for whatever I don't talk about here. Um, but a lot of you may have credit for chemistry, uh, from chemistry AP with a four or a five. Um, and if you either, with either of those scores, you will uh, get credit for, it'll say Chem 105 and 106 and Chem 113, which is a lab, but really what you get out of as an engineer is Chem 111, which is listed here as number four. Uh, you, you still get, uh, you, you, would, you don't get out of Engineering 145, which is the second semester of chemistry in the freshman year. So I show you that you can skip right to that as a first semester student. And then you'll have me in the fall. That's right. There you go. <laughs> so you already are going to meet one of your instructors right now. <laughs> um, uh, another AP to consider, of course, is your math AP. And a lot of people get uh, take the calculus AP. There's two types, uh, the AB and the BC. For the AB uh, AP, if you get a 4 or 5, you get out of one semester of math, which is Math 121, and you go right to the second semester. If you are taking the BC exam, you can get out of both semesters in the first year and move right on to the third semester of math, which is Math 223. Can, do you mind if I jump in? Go for ahead. Just a the one thing I want to say about AP is uh, I've seen AP students come in and they get out of the first two semesters and go into the third and, and crash and burn, and that's a miserable experience. And I've also seen students come out and get the come out, get AP'd out of the first two and do very well. Um, you need to be comfortable with where you are. So just because your test said you can get out of the first two semesters, if you're uncertain, it's not um, a knock to go back and retake and get an easy A or something. So my, one of the things I always give as advice is make sure you're comfortable with the math skills. If you're not certain, take the placement exam that they offer to make sure you're comfortable with it. And you always have two weeks to make a decision on the classes. So um, the math, and the chemistry and the physics are core to everything else you're going to do. If you don't have the solid foundation, you're going to be in trouble. So um, use it if you can, by all means, use it, but make sure you're comfortable with that AP, that you really are solid in that core. That's my only caveat. And if you're uncertain, again, come talk to us. But that's, that's the only thing I want to really add about mm -hmm. AP. Yeah, and in that two-week period, the drop-add period that Dustin mentioned, you, know, you can make changes to your schedule. So you could even go and attend uh, you know, the class, like say Math 121, and attend Math 223, and get the syllabus and see what you think. So again, it's about being comfortable uh, with, with what you're going to take. So, okay. Um, a couple of things to point out um, for those of you who like physics and did well on your physics APs, um, even if you did a five on the electricity and magnetism exam, you still have to take uh, e and M at case uh, you just don't get out. I was I had to take E and M. I was disappointed. But anyway, <laughs> that's something that you'll still get credit. It's an open elective physics credit, but it's just something to point out to you now. Uh, and the other little bubble on my <laughs> slide here is uh, about phys ed. Uh, phys ed uh, can be taken as a full semester phys ed, or they have half semesters. And you can even just take one half semester if you don't find two that you like. So you don't have to take two uh, in one semester. So that's just a comment about phys ed. Um, one other thing to point out, which brought up about what Dustin said about being comfortable with things, um, sometimes students that uh, uh, test out of chemistry may want to go ahead and take organic chemistry, uh, which you can do. 
as a first year student, but the question is when did you last take your chemistry course in high school? If you just took it as a senior or maybe as a junior, again, you need to think about whether you're comfortable. If you took it as a sophomore, you probably do not want to go into organic chemistry, even if you are pre-med uh, and want to take, uh, you know, 20 courses all at once. So <laughs> at least it seems that way with some free meds. But anyway, uh, you know, just think about what you're doing and, and you can always again come to us and ask these questions. Uh, and one other thing about the math AP, uh, when you do get tested out into the third semester of math, there is an honors calculus course, Math 227, which you may be invited to take. And that is a class that's only for first year students. So that's kind of something to think about. That's not like you're thrown in with the sophomores right away. You actually have a class of your own. So other than that, I'd say that once you have the AP credit, you can start looking at your second year. In my case, I just showed the chemical engineering one, but you'll, you saw the other ones, or you'll see the one for macro coming right up. Uh, think about those courses you can throw in there. Dave. Okay. So actually, oh. just very briefly, just mentioned our, our, our sister department, material science, who's not here. And if we're all the soft organic type of matter, they're the metals and the ceramics, the, the, the really hard stuff. They're, everything that's been said about the first year experience applies the same to to material science or the same math physics chemistry sages humanities and social sciences that everyone else will be taking Heidi's done a great job of covering the so the, the AP in fact the AP it's the same on all of us I just want to point out on line five there's also a, a freshman course in material science where it allows you to get get a, a gentle introduction to it again it's a way of test driving the major you know these are really great courses this one the the one in biomed one in chemical engineering it, it's it's kind of a low risk way of tr trying it out so everything that we've said so far applies to our friends in material science and engineering and we'll go on um, similarly in polymer science and engineering the name of the degree that the macro department uh, grants Again, the same core math, physics, chemistry, the same impacts of, of AP that Heidi talked about. So everything we said goes over and over to all these departments. We'll point out our unique freshman course is a research course. It's called EMAC 125. It is by permission of instructor. That's me, and you get to that by, by sending me an email, and we have a little conversation. And what we, you don't have to be a polymer science and engineering major to take that. But what we're looking for is people who think they might want to go into some area of materials. And you can do materials in a lot of different departments, a lot of different ways. So, um, but you, you send me an email, das44 at case.edu, and we have a conversation over, over a couple of days and chat and see whether this one makes sense for you. We'll, we take 18 students each semester, so potentially you could take it this coming semester, potentially you could take it in the spring also. So I think we need to get on, I think we need to get to questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we are. Yeah, so I guess we turn, turn it back to Lynn Marie and questions. Great, lots of great information. We do have some questions coming in and just want to remind students that if you do have questions, you can send it to summerregehelp at case.edu. But the first question we have is from Tony, and he'd like to know, are the core engineering classes that were just mentioned taken during one year or multiple years? Yeah, it's a good question, Tony. Thanks. Um, they're, they're spread out over the years. Um, usually the first two you'll get through most of them. You want to get them done probably in the first two. Um, what you again, come talk to somebody when you get into your discipline because the order you take them may vary between each department. So for example, in electrical engineering or in a bioelectric area, you would want to take your circuits course before you might take your thermal course or the more chemistry oriented courses and that would change if you're in a more chemically oriented. So most of that core will be, be completed probably by the end of your second year, um, maybe one or two courses left in the third year, but by then you'll be done. So. Um, First two years mostly, but you'll need to talk to somebody to get uh, to get the details for your department. Great. And just a reminder, if we can kind of keep answers uh, on brief side, because we do have lots of questions that are coming in. Um, this one we've had about four times, so it's really um, towards Professor Tyler. Could you lay out a typical first year course load for a pre-medical biomedical engineering major? Yeah, the first year pre-med is about 40 credits. <laughs> 
I'm just kidding. That's what they tend to take. I mean, I think what you see on, on the, the first year, which is brought up here, this is typical of, of pre-med as well as the others. The thing I recommend is that you, you come in and it's really their second semester. And it's the first semester of the second year becomes critical where the difference is getting in the organic chemistry and the, getting set for your MCATs. So the short answer is it's the same as what you see here. Um, the caveats and the, the things to think about with AP are usually I find more with the med students because they tend to come with a lot of AP courses. And so we'll try to move up courses and talk with somebody to bring them up to get as much prepared for the MCAT classes that you'll need to take maybe in addition. So it doesn't change a lot from what you see here. Great, thanks. This one I think is for Professor Martin. We, Laura wants to major in chemical engineering with a minor in German. The chemie department already has class schedules planned out, but there's really no opportunity to take humanities in their freshman year. So she's wondering how she would build in a German class and work on that German minor. Um, well, there is a little bit of room for humanities, but you're right, there's not much room in uh, in your first year. But actually, uh, the number of credit hours uh, for a chemical engineering or other engineering majors in the first semester is listed at being you know 15 to 16 credits but actually if you want to go ahead and take a foreign language course they will let you take a foreign language course in that first semester even though it's technically an overload but for foreign languages they allow that so there is there is there's quite a few students who actually uh, take foreign languages for minors uh, so there, there there should be room for it Thank you. We have another question from Scott who wants to know why is Engineering 131 preferred to take over physics for most engineering majors? Does it really matter? You mean the first semester? Um, yes. Well, well, I think that definitely depends. I know in chemical engineering we actually prefer physics to be first. Um, I, I think it's maybe the use of the Engineering 131 material may, be, may come sooner in the curriculum or I'm not really sure what is yeah, I think Your judgment. I'd... It's sort of up to the, to the student. We tend to recommend the 131, but they're both going to be important, and whether you take them both the first, I mean, whichever you take first is sort of up to your preference. So it's not strict that you take 131 in one discipline and, and 121, you know, physics in the other. It also depends on your background, too. Mm -hmm. if, you, mm -hmm. if you have a very strong physics background, then getting the computer the computer background added to your mix might be better early on. If, on the other hand, you, you don't have a very strong physics background, I would say as an advisor, pound the physics in early because it's fundamental to all seven departments. Thanks. We, this one is directed towards um, Professor Tyler, but I think it can be um, answered by anyone. Can a biomedical engineering major or someone in whatever engineering department student focus on more than one of the four major tracks or specialty sequences in your individual departments? Uh, that is a, that's a good question. You will get experience in all of them. So if you, uh, what I didn't go over is the biomedical core, and it has materials, it has computer science, it has instrumentation devices, it has signals and processing. So you get aspects of all tracks. The thing that's critical is that when you graduate, you have a core that you can say you're a solid engineer in. So you'll clearly get experience across the spectrum of double E. You're not going to simply be electrical engineer and forget the rest. But you need to have a core that you can, you can point to and say, I'm very good at this area of, of engineering. And so that's why we organize them around tracks. But as Heidi mentioned earlier, too, we're collaborative. So you're involved with all the different departments, as we've said already, as well as the tracks within BME. But you need to have a solid core that when you're going out to get hired, you can, you can say, this is what I do. And that's why we give an emphasis to these different tracks. Okay, Becca would like to know, for the physical education requirements, if you're participating in a sport, do you still need to fulfill that course? Uh, go ahead. It counts. Oh, it, it counts. counts. There is a specific uh, varsity, there's specific uh, course numbers for mm -hmm. varsity sports. So look for that in the list and you put that in and actually you might talk to the coach because sometimes even when it's off season there might be a training that you do and that also counts toward the physical education requirement so check with your coach as to when you register for it and by all means that counts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and by the way there are a lot of student athletes in engineering Don't, the, the engineers are not just eggheads here uh -huh. we're very proud that this, past, this group that just graduated this, this past May, for example, in our department, we had a young woman who was an All-American in both volleyball and in track and field. And she also had an incredible GPA and, and landed a great job in Chicago. So, um, you know, we're, we're a lot more than that. Similarly, the, uh, the, the quest about German, an awful lot of engineering majors are language minors, too. It's a very popular area, and it broadens your, 
your base. Not just language. I have many students that are minoring in the arts someplace. Yeah. So oh, it's music. In, actually yeah, several, dance. Yeah, yeah. several it's in impressive. music. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a few questions uh, that have come in on this topic. I've received a five on the AP computer science exam, which gives me credit for uh, ESIS 132. Does this mean that I should still take the 131 elementary computer science class? No. We weren't supposed to give short answers, but it's easy. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty straightforward. So what would I take instead? You can start with your physics, then the 121, and move into those. I mean, basically, you've got that core out of the way, and just start taking courses and move up others. Mm -hmm. Just, just go, to the, you know, go to the next semester and find an appropriate course to pull over. Okay. Would it be possible to get into the pre-law track while still majoring in engineering? And if so, how difficult would that be? I mean, it is possible. I have, we had one student several years ago that went to law school. Um, I can't say I remember the details, but if you, you could talk to your advisor again, when you get to campus, you know, meet up with, you know, get an advisor early, talk to them about what you want to do, because that is a, a, a big possibility. There are students that go uh, pre-law and they're engineers. Mm -hmm. And there's a specific mm -hmm. office that will advise you as a pre-law. Pre there's a pre-med office that will give you the nuts and bolts of being pre-med, there's one for pre-law. We also had one, one of my first advisees when I came here is, pr is a practicing patent attorney in California right now. And any of these seven departments as a feed into engineering, if, especially if you're interested in patent law, is an incredibly rich career opportunity. I mean, patent lawyers have to be scientists or engineers. Okay, we have another question coming in. I would like to major in chemistry, but I may want to major in chemical engineering. What courses should I take first semester, and how easy is it to change from one to the other? Well, you've endeared yourself to me because I did a double degree in chemistry and chemical engineering. <laughs> so I understand about having uh, to try to make this choice. Um, what you should do in terms of your chemistry requirements is go with the engineering requirements in terms of chemistry 111. Um, if you decide to switch to chemistry or if you do a double major, the requirement for engineering will be accepted by the chemistry department also for chemistry. They have a separate set of classes, but Chem 111 plus Engineering 145 will, is the equivalent of Chem 105 and 106. There is a freshman chemistry lab that you have to take as a fresh as a chemistry major and depending on how sure you are about doing the chemistry major you could go ahead and take that lab or not. If you decide to stay chemical engineer uh, that lab isn't required but it will act as a prerequisite for a chemistry lab that you can take later on that would be a requirement so it's not a useless thing to do. So by all means, and if you are interested in doing a double major, you can come and talk to me specifically or even about the differences between the two. I'll gladly meet with you and talk about it. Great. So we have a student who's concerned that they may be placed into Math 120, and they're wondering if that will put them behind as an engineering major, and can they still do an engineering major if they do need to take the pre-calculus course? Um. I mean, my, my basic comment is do whatever it takes to get your solid math core. I mean, if it mm -hmm. takes 120, do that because you'll be farther behind by trying to get, you know, into the early math and then not doing well. Um, typically, you can make up that time somewhere else down the road. So there, you know, there are flexibilities in there in the places in your schedule. So, I mean, if your concern is see what the, where they say you should be placed. Um, but, you know, in the end, get the math skills. If you don't have those, it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, it's going to be tough. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but that's my... Well, it's a journey. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day is, at the end of four years, we want to get you to a certain place professionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a race where you have to be in exactly the right place at the end of one semester or two semesters. It's after eight semesters you, we need to get you there. So there is, there is flexibility. Yeah, and that, uh, the math requirement may affect your physics courses. That'd be the only other thing, and you might, in that case, go ahead and take programming, you know, Engineering 131 instead of physics, uh, mm -hmm. while you you get that pre-calculus background. You can also take some of your humanities earlier on that don't have prereqs if you have space to fill because mm -hmm. of other prereq things. So again, you know, if you get in that situation, talk to one of us when you get here as well for the details. But uh, if you have to take it, take it by all means. Um, That's why we offer it. That's right. Exactly right. <laughs> That's, right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Great. Um, so I have a student, uh, if I'm intended a pre-med student with an interest in engineering, more specifically BME, 
would you recommend an engineering major over biochemistry or, bi hmm. or biology per se? In other words, under what circumstances would you recommend engineering over science? Uh, are there any benefits or drawbacks? Uh, it depends what the most important or most interesting part of a remote control is to you. If it's the insides, you should be an engineer. If it's the outside, you should probably figure one of the other tracks. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I say that sort of tongue in cheek, but what I mean is it, it, it really is what drives you. I mean, the, the mindset between an engineer and a biologist is different. You know, if you, if you enjoy the biology and you like to sort of learn the way things are, I think that's what is something you should consider. Because I get a lot of, and the reason I say this is there are plenty of pre-meds that aren't engineers, and we build engineers, and they, they struggle, and they, they, they need to keep a good GPA, but they don't like engineering, and I'm going to make them an engineer. And so if you're not an engineer in your nature, then I would recommend something other than engineering, um, because it's the hardest way, frankly, to get to the med school, I and mean, that's why it's taken so well, but I'm going to make you be an engineer. So if you like to build things, you like to look how they work, you like the math, you like the equations, you like to figure it out, do the engineering. If those don't excite you, you're just trying to do it to get into med school because you're supposed to and it's going to be a good way to do it, you're going to struggle and you're going to end up in a worse place than, than you would before. So it really, I can't answer that without talking to you directly, but my advice is to, if you're an engineer, Go engineering BME. If you're not, if you don't like those things, if you don't like the math, it's kind of a dangerous route for you. And that's true for any other target you have. You, you need to major in the subject that really excites you, mm -hmm. the thing that turns you on. This is not, otherwise it's going to be just, just you know, a gruesome four years. So don't do something because you think you need to do it or sorry mom and dad because mom and dad said you need to do this or whatever. You need to do exactly because this excites me so much I want to do this. And if that gets you to med school or law school or dent school or biz school or grad school, great. If it doesn't, it'll take you to some place that is aligned with the subject that you really like in the first place. Okay, so I have a student who's concerned about the number of hours that they take. They want to know if they only take 14 credit hours of courses in the fall semester just to get used to being on campus and taking college courses, will they be behind in their, will they be behind in their major? Again, I think it goes back to the question we answered before about calculus. I think you do what you feel you need to. If you come in and you, know, you feel only comfortable with that many credits, I think you, it'll work out for you. There is some flexibility in the curriculum so that you should be able to make up for, I mean, you, you're probably talking about just one class less than you would have taken uh, to, and even, you know, with 14 credits, uh, it's still probably, what, four, four classes maybe? Three. So yeah, three classes. So you're, you're probably, you know, just one class uh, difference. So I think if that's what you choose to do, then you should be fine. Again, that two-week drop ad period, you can try out that extra course, see whether you really think you can handle it, and if not, you have time to drop it. Well, in fact, in your, in your first semester mm -hmm. as a freshman, you have what's called freshman forgiveness. Oh, that's right. So, so normally you have that two weeks, but in the, your first semester, you have the entire semester up to the last day of class. So you can give it, you, you can give it the, you know, the, the old college tries, we say, and if halfway or two-thirds of the way semester you say, this is killing me and I can't do it and I'm going to flunk out on my classes, I need to drop this one class, then you have the opportunity, no harm, no foul. Uh, only the first semester, but you, but you do have it. So it's, it's, you know, just make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Mm -hmm. Now, don't do it because you want to stay up all night and play World of Warcraft or something. You know, <laughs> you know, you know it's because you do it because you have a legit, legit concern. Okay, I think this will probably be our last question. So Rachel would like to know, she sees that there's three to four humanities social science electives that need to be taken. Are they mandatory? When is it, uh, what's an approved sequence, if anything, that they have to do? And can AP credit count for any of those courses? I'll take that one. So yes, they are required. They don't have to all be in a sequence. They can be from four different departments. Uh, and uh, the last part was AP. AP. Yeah, and AP credit, definitely you can get credit for your humanities. So again, it has to be, in some cases, I think maybe a three, but mostly fours and fives mm -hmm. on those exams. And that's one where, from my earlier thing, I would say use every one of them you can get, okay. frankly. So the math and the physics, make sure you're solid. AP, take them. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, because you know, think about it, all you're doing is you're carving out space in your schedule. Yep. Exactly. So if there is a semester where you're taking some brutal courses and you want to take one less, you can do it and you still graduate on time. Or maybe you, you know, in your heart of hearts, you've always wanted to take a Shakespeare course or a, philo or a philosophy course or astronomy or geology. It gives you an opportunity to take one of those as well. 
Okay, I think that's all we have for questions. I don't know if our uh, hosts have any final comments they'd like to make before we wrap up at 8 o'clock. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start and probably just short down the line. I think we'll probably vamp. But uh, ultimately, we hope we've given you enough information to get you started, at least for the fall. But the case is a place where there's a lot of doors for you. There's a lot of opportunities. You need to figure out what you want to do, and the best way to figure that out and how to best navigate is to come talk to us. So um, I look forward to seeing you in the fall. Uh, if you have any other questions, many of them can be answered at our website, bme.case.edu, specifically for biomedical. My email address, if not posted, is, is tough, dustin.tyler at case.edu. And I look forward to seeing you in the fall. All right. Yeah, I just want to chime in and say thanks for uh, for watching us and for all of your great questions. And uh, that's the great thing about Case, the faculty, we're accessible and we're here for you. And so please do come knock on our doors and send us email and uh, we'll be there for you and help you out get started. We look forward to seeing you. It's gonna be a great year. Thank you. Yeah, and like, I'll just add to that, it, it's incredibly fun. We're looking forward to seeing you during Welcome Week and then the first day of classes and so forth. It's, a, it's an exciting time. We, we, all, we, all, we all get excited getting to meet you um, and uh, check out the websites for specific questions and then you know it's pretty easy to find Tyler Martin or Sheraldi there's probably one of each of us you know in, in the college and so you know feel free to send emails and check us out too All right. Thank you, Professor Tyler, Martin, Sheraldi. I just want to thank all of our viewers this evening, and as a little programming note, I guess, to remind students that we do have a few more online information sessions um, this week. Tomorrow we will have this College of Arts and Sciences for people from the Math and Natural Sciences Department, and next week we'll have student or faculty from the Biological Sciences, Humanities, and the Performing Arts. So we encourage you to look on the New Student Online Information Session website for the dates and times. Thank you for joining us this evening. Have a good evening.